Hello, everyone, and welcome. Uh, thanks a lot for joining us today. My name is Elizabeth Ada, and I direct the Board on Our Sciences and Resources and the Water Science and Technology Board at the National Academies of Sciences, Engineering, and Medicine. I have the real pleasure of serving as your moderator for today's webinar on the 2019 Ridgecrest earthquakes, hosted by the Board on Our Sciences and Resources and the Committee on Seismology and Geodynamics. We're delighted that Dr. Richard Allen and Dr. Eric Fielding were available on rather short notice after these earthquakes to share their insights on these events that began actually almost um, precisely two weeks ago. Now, before turning the microphone over to Richard, I wanted to review the agenda and how you can provide questions for either of our speakers. And you'll see something on the screen momentarily to help you with that. So Richard and Eric will each speak for about 20 minutes after which we'll share your questions with them for that final quarter of an hour or so of our, of our, of our uh, webinar. So to ask a question, you can use the question and answer box, which you can locate by hovering your mouse near the bottom of your screen. And you should see a button there labeled Q&A. So you can then type in and send your questions there. And we'd ask you to use the Q&A box and not the chat feature. Um, and you can send those questions at any point during the webinar. Dr. Deb Glickson, who oversees the Committee on Seismology and Geodynamics, and I will be making note of your questions as they're entered throughout the hour, and then we'll share them with Richard and Eric. And um, while we're really excited to have so many of you interested in this webinar, I'll ask you please to realize that we won't be able to get to all of your questions um, in that final quarter of an hour, but we'll certainly do the best we can. Uh, and should you have any technical issues, please use the Q&A feature or email Remy directly, you see his email uh, address up there on the screen, archipetta at nas.edu. So with that said, let me introduce Richard and Eric and get us underway. Um, Richard is the director of the Berkeley Seismological Laboratory and professor in the Department of Earth and Planetary Science at the University of California, Berkeley. He's focused significant effort in earthquake alerting systems developing methodologies to detect earthquakes and issue warnings prior to shaking. Obviously, we'll be hearing more about that today. Eric is a principal scientist at the Jet Propulsion Laboratory, California Institute of Technology, and his research interests include active tectonics and fault interaction via the transfer of stresses with applications to earthquake assessment. So with that said, I'd like to turn the floor over to you now, Richard. Um, so whenever you're ready, you can start sharing your screen and, and get underway. All right. Um, well, thank you, Elizabeth. Um, let me bring up my slides here. Can you see my slides now? Yes, we can. Perfect. Great. All right. Well, thank you, Elizabeth. Um, so I'm going to focus, as Elizabeth just said, on the earthquake early warning aspect of the Ridgecrest um, earthquakes. Um, earthquake early warning, for those who are not familiar, it's a relatively new technology, it's a relatively new approach to reducing hazard, and it's all about very rapidly detecting the beginnings of an earthquake, um, assessing the size of the earthquake, the scale of the earthquake, and then pushing out a warning to people before they feel the shaking. And we're talking about a few seconds to a few tens of seconds of warning. That's the goal of earthquake early warning systems. Um, and we've been working here in the US, so many of us have been working towards developing an early warning system um, that is now operational. It's called ShakeAlert. Um, and so I'm going to focus uh, in my 20 minutes on talking about how ShakeAlert performed during the course of this earthquake, the first real big test um, for the early warning system. Um, and some of the lessons that we can learn and, and take away um, from this particular earthquake. Okay, so first of all, what exactly is the status of ShakeAlert um, right now and at the time of these earthquakes? Um, ShakeAlert has been under development um, by a very large group of people. You can see um, some of the institutions involved in its development over the course of the last decade. Um, at the USGS is the lead agency and they have the statutory responsibility for delivering alerts. Um, it's also in partnership with state agencies, in particular Cal OES has been very involved in building the infrastructure, supporting the infrastructure um, for the system. Um, and then of course the universities um, on the west coast that run the seismic networks, Berkeley, Caltech, Oregon and the University of Washington. And I also want to include the Gordon Betty Moore Foundation who made a significant investment in the development of ShakeAlert over the course of the last years. Okay, so it's been under development for a while, but the, the big switch 
was flipped back in October of 2018. And in October of 2018, it was officially declared Shake Alert was open for business. It was generating alerts um, that were available for use. Now, what exactly does that mean? Um, Shake Alert is operating in California, Oregon, and Washington, so the three uh, West Coast states. Um, it's available, the alerts are available for use by technical and industrial users. So think of these as being um, uh, expert users who can receive the alerts, they can digest them, they have an under, a real understanding, and then they can use them to automate systems or take other kinds of responses. But the alerts were only available to a limited cross-section of the public. Specifically, they were available to the population of Los Angeles. Um, and that's through an app, and I'm going to talk quite a bit about the app that was available um, and to issue the alerts across, um, across the county of Los Angeles. So that was the status of ShakeAlert at the time um, of these earthquakes. Okay, and so just one slide to introduce the earthquakes. Um, of course, there were two main events um, that were part of the Ridgecrest sequence. It really started with a magnitude 6.4 earthquake. Hopefully you can see my pointer a 6.4 earthquake up here in the Mojave Desert um, in the morning of July the 4th. And then it was, there was a magnitude 7.1, fairly close to the first event um, that came a day later at about 8.20 um, in the evening. And what matters here for early warning is the distance between the people, the people were warning, and the earthquakes. Um, the population, of course, close to the epicenter of these earthquakes is pretty uh, sparse. But the population is really focused in Los Angeles. And so that's why I've labeled this. Los Angeles is about 200 kilometers away from these earthquakes. Of course, these are the two main events, um, but there are, have been thousands of aftershocks associated with them as well. Uh, this plot comes from Doug Given and the USGS and just shows the time history of the events uh, with the magnitude. And you see, just as we expect, the main events followed by aftershock sequences um, for this, what's been a very, very active a um, few days. Okay, so that's the earthquakes. So how did ShakeAlert perform? How did the early warning system perform in these events? So I'm going to show you a video now. I'm going to play a video. It's a, it's a replay of a tool that we call the user display. This is a desktop um, application um, that many people run um, to receive warnings from the ShakeAlert system. For a typical use for this kind of application is in a kind of an emergency operations center so people can actually see what's going on um, and see earthquakes occurring in real time. And I, what I'm showing you here is a replay of the warning that they had at LA City Hall. And so that's what the little, little house symbol here is showing that this is a warning for downtown Los Angeles at LA, um, at LA City Hall. So let's play what happened. So as soon as the earthquakes detected, um, you start to get the warning. And you can see the yellow and the red circles here. That shows the P wave and the S wave radiating out from the earthquake. In the lower left here, it's telling you the warning information for your location. This is a countdown, 30 seconds, still 30 seconds until the S wave, so most of the strongest shaking, arrives in downtown LA. Um, then down here, this is the intensity expected at, in downtown LA, intensity three. And this shows the estimated magnitude for the earthquake. So still we have still 15, 13 seconds, 12 seconds until the S wave arrives in Los Angeles. So you probably noticed at the beginning there was about 48 seconds of warning um, until the S wave arrived right about now. And so this gives you a sense of the warning that ShakeAlert provided. Again, about 48 seconds of warning for downtown Los Angeles um, with a shaking, expected shaking intensity of three for the downtown LA area. Okay, so just in case you didn't capture that all as it flew by, here's the, the snapshots of, of the key pieces in time here. So this is the first alert um, that was pushed out, 48 seconds of warning. Initially, um, the, the magnitude estimate was 5.7, and so the shaking intensity in um, downtown LA was estimated to be intensity two. About two seconds later, the estimated intensity goes up, or up to intensity three at this point. Um, it then remains at intensity three for the duration of the event. The estimated magnitude does gradually increase, reaching a magnitude of 6.3, um, some tens of seconds later. So that was the alert um, for the, the 6.4. Now, what actually was the ground shaking in the magnitude 6.4? Well, this is the USGS shake map for this earthquake. So obviously the epicenter is up here, um, and the colors 
show stronger shaking closest to the epicenter. As you go further from the epicenter, of course, the shaking intensity decreases. This blue line here um, is the threshold um, for intensity four. So down here in Los Angeles area is all um, in sort of intensity three region based on these contours. But I will point out, if you actually look at all of these triangles of stations, and so we have actual observations of what the shaking intensity was, many of them are intensity three, of course, but there are a few intensity fours down here in the downtown region as well. Okay, so that was the performance for the magnitude 6.4 earthquake. Now onto the magnitude 7.1 earthquake. Same thing, I'm gonna show you the video um, for the alert in downtown um, Los Angeles. About the same initial warning, obviously 49 seconds in this case. Um, intensity very rapidly becomes intensity three. Um, and the magnitude estimate creeps up with time. Um, still 30 seconds until um, the warning arrives. So of course the idea behind warning is that you use this time to take protective measures. So right now everybody sat in front of their computers could be getting under the sturdy desk that they're probably sat um, in front of. So that by the time this S wave arrives, if you were in downtown Los Angeles, you'd be in a safe location um, to prevent things falling on your head and um, things like that. Okay, so that's the same warning video for the, the magnitude 7.1. So then again, let's capture the key points here. So the first alert was 49 seconds before um, the S wave reached Los Angeles. Initially, magnitude 5.5 and an intensity of two. Um, after three seconds, um, the magnitude has increased and we're up to intensity three. And the warning remains at intensity three for downtown LA. Um, for the duration of the event. Um, the final magnitude estimate, um, it gets up to a magnitude 6.3. So frankly, that's not great. The actual magnitude is 7.1, and I'll come back to that in a few moments. Um, so the alert intensity was three. What was the observed shaking intensity in downtown LA? So again, the shake map, um, this is the bigger event, of course. And so the contours are all pushed further out. And um, this contour here is the 3.5 contour, meaning that this region, basically downtown Los Angeles, oops, downtown Los Angeles actually experienced intensity four um, during the course of this earthquake. Okay, so that's the, that's the performance. I've obviously focused on downtown LA. And so the question comes, was this a success for Shake Alert? This was the first significant event. Unfortunately, all your microphones are turned off, so I will, I'll tell you what I think. Um, I would say that this was a success for Shake Alert. It was the first major event. It pushed out a warning, and I would say that the warning was pretty accurate to what was actually experienced. So that would be my take. Okay, but how was it received by people in Los Angeles? Well, they, receive, they see it very differently. So here's a few newspaper articles. This one in the Los Angeles Times, um, immediately after the magnitude 6.4, why LA's early warning system didn't send an alert before the magnitude 6.4. So LA's early warning system didn't push out an alert. New York Times is after the second earthquake, California's alert apps didn't sound for the two big earthquakes. Why not? Um, and then finally, as time went on, I think that uh, we sort of shifted from the, the understanding being that the early warning system didn't work because people didn't get an alert to people actually understanding the nuances of the, of the system that in fact the system worked exactly as planned. And as this uh, third article uh, uh, headline says, that's the problem, it worked exactly as planned. So, so why is there this disconnect? I would say, I think the geophysics community, seismology community would say that the system did very well but clearly the population in LA is very dissatisfied with the system because they didn't get a warning. So why is that? Okay, so here's the reason. So as I mentioned at the beginning, um, the city of Los Angeles is the only region right now that is making the alerts public. And the reason for that is that the city of LA developed an app that's called Shake Alert LA. Um, it was uh, developed by the, the city, as you can see, in 2019. And it was decided that the threshold for the alerts, when this app would alert people, um, is when the magnitude of the earthquake is greater than or equal to magnitude five and the intensity is greater than or equal to intensity four. 
in the county of Los Angeles. So this is only this only works um, in the county of Los Angeles, and you have to satisfy those two conditions before an alert is pushed out. Okay, so let's compare that then to what actually happened with these two earthquakes. First of all, in the July 4th um, earthquake, um, as you saw a moment ago, the alert intensity in LA was intensity three. And so of course, no alert was pushed out to the app. The observed intensity was intensity three, and there were a few observations of intensity four. So did it work? Did it work as expected? I would say, yes, it, this was correct, mostly. I say mostly just because there were some observations of intensity four, but most observations in LA for this earthquake were intensity three. And then for the July 5th magnitude 7.1 earthquake, the alert intensity was again intensity three and therefore no alert was issued. But the observed intensity was most definitely an intensity four. Um, and so in that sense, it did not work correctly because um, it did not push out an alert, but there was shaking intensity four. But as you can see, it was pretty close. So the threshold is intensity four, the alert estimated alert intensity was three, um, so it didn't quite reach the threshold and so no alert was pushed out. So that's why I say, I think that the system worked pretty well, but what is very clear is that from a user perspective, the system completely failed and there's no sugar coating um, of that. Okay, so what are the key takeaways that we should um, take from this? What are the things that we can learn from this? I have sort of three key points. The first is that people want lower threshold alerts. I think that is loud and clear in terms of what we're hearing from people. They don't just want warnings for damaging earthquakes. They want warnings for experienced earthquakes. What I mean by that is that with the reason that the thresholds were set at intensity four is because that's when you start to see damage. Um, and so the thinking was that we should be pushing out warnings when people are going to see damage. And what is very clear that that is that people don't expect that. People expect to get a warning if they're going to experience the earthquake, i.e. they're going to experience, they're going to feel significant shaking. The other thing is it's clearly better to over alert than under alert. And I think that's part of a sort of generational change that is going on right now, that people would rather have more information um, than less information and then be able to decide what to do with it. The second one is that I think Shake Alert performed very well. Um, I'm quite pleased, I have to say, with the performance of Shake Alert. In the case of the magnitude 6.4 earthquake, we got a very good magnitude estimate, a very good location and intensity estimate, so we did a really good job. In the case of the 7.1, I would class, ca uh, characterize it as a disappointing magnitude estimate. It was an estimate of 6.3, so it was, it was low by 0.8 magnitude units. The rule of thumb that I use in my head is that we expect the magnitude estimate to be within half a magnitude. Um, of the true magnitude. And we were a little more than that, 0.8 off. Um, however, as the earthquakes get bigger, estimating the magnitude just become more challenging. So this was disappointing, but I think we need to understand however much great work we do in the future to improve the magnitudes, and I'm sure we will, whatever system we design has to understand and has to recognize, and the users have to recognize that we can have errors of this kind of size. The location was very good. The intensities were okay. It was off by one intensity unit, and that was because of the magnitude estimate. And then finally, the third piece that I think is sort of largely forgotten, but is really critical here, is that we have to take note of the fact that the seismic and networks, they performed really great. And what I mean by that is that they provided data. They've been reporting on more than 15,000 earthquakes um, over the course of the last few days. All of the infrastructure worked as expected. Um, we didn't have any failures um, to the system. Obviously, the system generated shake alerts. It generated all of the other products, moment tensors, shake maps I showed you. All of these products were, um, were generated successfully. And then, of course, the websites and the social media outlets that we use to distribute this information have been used by millions of users. And so I think this is a huge, a great success that we shouldn't forget about um, for this particular earthquake. And then so, you know, in summary, the top P, the, um, this question of how we push out the alerts, we really didn't do a good job here. And we clearly need to improve our understanding of the needs and the expectations of the users. That's a key lesson to be learned here. Shake Alert, I think, did well, but clearly there's room for improvement. And there are already many people working on what those improvements might look like. And finally, the networks did great. And I just want to mention um, our colleagues at Caltech 
and at the USGS in Pasadena, who are of course operating the networks in Southern California, have really done a fantastic job um, over the course, well, both building up to these earthquakes because the system then worked. And then of course, since these earthquakes occurred, um, keeping the system operational and pushing all that out, all of that information. And that's the point that I really want to end on. This is my last slide, um, is that we're really in a very fortunate situation now where we have good, robust, and geophysical networks up and down the West Coast. Um, this is the network that is feeding data into ShakeAlert today um, in California, Oregon, and Washington. ShakeAlert started out with just the blue stations um, and then expanded, of course, up into Oregon and Washington, and then has been adding stations in California, Oregon, and Washington. There are currently 917 stations. The gray dots here adds in the stations that are planned. A total of 1,675 stations are planned for ShakeAlert. In fact, the majority of these have now been funded in California. Um, and so I, I think this is something to really take away from this, that we now have these robust um, geophysical networks um, across the West Coast that are providing data both to reduce hazards um, in event sequences like this and to understand these earthquakes, and also for the fundamental science that follows from events like this, and of course can be uh, making use of the data at all of the times. One thing to mention is that approximately one third of these stations are broadband stations, and about two thirds of them um, are, strong motion, are strong motion stations. Okay, I'm gonna stop there, um, and I will uh, pass over to Eric. Great, Richard. Thank you so much. And, and Eric, when you can share your, your screen and, and just you're, you're good to go. Um, Eric, I think you're muted. Hello. Yes, sorry. It, uh, it told me the host had muted me, so it wouldn't let me unmute. So um, I'm a geophysicist at the Jet Propulsion Laboratory. Eric, my name is Eric Fielding, and uh, the Jet Propulsion Laboratory is operated by the California Institute of Technology uh, for NASA. Uh, so we are uh, supported by NASA, but we actually work for Caltech. Uh, I'm not going to uh, go into detail for this uh, more eye candy uh, picture on the on the first slide here, uh, but so I'm going to go back to the next slide. Uh, the I'm going to be talking about the surface deformation aspect of this earthquake. Uh, the this is a map of the long-term deformation that's measured by the GPS network that's operated by UNAFCO. Uh, there's a whole a lot of GPS stations in California, and the, we can see that the, the Pacific plate is moving to the northwest relative to uh, North America. And there's this wide zone here uh, where the, the arrows get shorter and shorter, and that's showing that there's a, a distributed uh, deformation across uh, California. The yellow line on this map is the San Andreas Fault, where the biggest part of the deformation is located, but there's also a significant amount of deformation that's located uh, further to the east, in primarily in what we call the Eastern California Shear Zone, uh, which is the location of this earthquake. This is a uh, map showing the earthquakes that have happened in Southern California in the last uh, 100 150 years. Uh, the 1857 earthquake was on the main San Andreas Fault, uh, but since 1857 has not had a significant earthquake. Uh, the Eastern California Shear Zone here in Eastern California has had uh, major earthquakes in 1872, 1992, the Landers earthquake, and 1999, the uh, Hector Mine earthquake, followed by the uh, earthquakes this year. We also had a, a, a major a magnitude 7.5 earthquake in uh, south of Bakersfield ca called the uh, Kern County earthquake, 1952. So, in fact, uh, for the last since 1857, 
the major earthquakes in Southern California have been off the San Andreas Fault. So one of the ways we can quickly get information about uh, which fault moved in an earthquake. This is not real-time information. This is uh, developed uh, in the days afterwards, uh, is to use GPS stations. This is a map made by my colleague, uh, Jing Kang Shen at UCLA, uh, showing the deformation of the magnitude 6.4 earthquake. Uh, and we can see that uh, stations moved up to, uh, the stations closest to the fault moved uh, up to about uh, eight centimeters, uh, 80, 80 millimeters. And the pattern of deformation shows us that the main rupture uh, from the, the magnitude 6.4 earthquake was on this northeast uh, southwest trending fault. Uh, then uh, on July 5th, uh, California time, it was actually July 6th in, in uh, universal time. Uh, there was a much larger magnitude 7.1 earthquake. And again, we have this map of the uh, GPS displacements uh, due to that earthquake. And we can see that uh, the pattern of deformation is different because in the 7.1 earthquake, the fault ruptured on this northeast, uh, a northwest southeast trend, uh, per roughly perpendicular to the fault that ruptured in the 6.4 earthquake. That's also shown by the aftershocks that are, are shown on this map. So the main uh, data that I work with is uh, what we call radar interferometry. It's a way of taking two radar images from before and after uh, the earthquake. Uh, because these earthquakes were only uh, 33 hours apart, uh, we didn't get a radar image in between the two earthquakes. So we can only see the uh, overall deformation from the two earthquakes together. Uh, this is a map showing the overall deformation uh, from a satellite called Sentinel-1 that's uh, owned by Copernicus, which is uh, a European Union uh, organization. It's operated by the European Space Agency. And we uh, process this data over this entire area. Uh, you can see LA is down here at the bottom. Uh, and we can see immediately that most of the deformation is on this northwest southeast trend, uh, which is the main rupture of the 7.1 earthquake. So we also uh, uh, process data from uh, a uh, Japanese satellite, the Japanese Aerospace Exploration Agency, ALOS 2 satellite, uh, acquired at the first image over this area. Uh, on uh, July, July 8th. So this is a map showing uh, the deformation over just a small area uh, concentrated on the ridge crest uh, because of the way they acquired this data. And uh, with aftershocks that were uh, estimated by, uh, these are uh, aftershocks relocated by a Professor uh, Zachary Ross at uh, Caltech. And again, we can see the main uh, deformation on this northwest southeast trend, but we can also see that there's a secondary uh, trend of deformation where there's a, a, a sharp color change that extends towards the southwest, uh, closer to the city of Ridgecrest, which is the star. And that uh, shorter uh, fault rupture to the southwest is the one that uh, ruptured in the 6.4 earthquake. And in fact, uh, we're getting uh, reports now that as they do a, a more detailed investigation that the damage in the city of Ridgecrest was actually more severe from the 6.4 uh, than the 7.1 because the fault uh, ruptured uh, closer to the city uh, than, than it did in the 7.1. We've also uh, did a type of analysis that's called a uh, pixel tracking. Uh, this is uh, a, a different way to take the difference between the two images. Uh, and it's by uh, doing cross correlation between the, the radar images. And because it's uh, working with the, it can actually extract two components of deformation. Uh, 
uh, we, uh, my colleague uh, Mon Hong Wong at the uh, University of Maryland was able to uh, send me this file uh, last night. Uh, uh, it's uh, not completely uh, uh, nice uh, presentation because it's uh, very off the hot off the presses. Uh, but he was able to combine uh, data from two different radar tracks to make uh, maps of the full three-dimensional deformation of the ground surface. So uh, here on the left is the vertical deformation. See, because this fault moves primarily sideways, uh, the vertical deformation is small, except for this one location here where uh, the ground surface moved down by uh, more than a meter. And uh, that is a, is a place where the fault, uh, th there's two separate faults that moved and uh, caused a block of the earth to, to drop downward. Uh, it's what we call a pull apart. And uh, the field geologists were actually able to map uh, some of this vertical uh, fault motion in the field. Uh, although the, this, most of, almost all of the rupture uh, from the 7.1 earthquake is inside a, a Navy base. Uh, so the access is uh, highly restricted and, and uh, uh, only uh, go government personnel so far have been able to uh, look at the faults in the field. But they did see this uh, vertical uh, block motion. And uh, now that we have this radar imagery, uh, we can see what, what the, the limits of that uh, block motion are. Then here in the middle, this is the east-west motion. This is sh uh, showing the, uh, the east-west component, which uh, shows the slip on the magnitude 6.4 earthquake, primarily on the north, uh, northeast-southwest uh, fault. And then uh, the, over here on the right is the north-south component of motion, which shows the very large slip of the 7.1 earthquake was uh, very actually very close to the epicenter of the earthquake. We also uh, have processed the uh, GPS data over a longer time interval that includes the two earthquakes at JPL. And this is a map showing the overall deformation uh, of the two earthquakes. This one station uh, closest to the fault rupture uh, moved over uh, 65 centimeters. That's more than two feet uh, during the two between the two earthquakes. Most of that deformation in the 7.1. And by taking this uh, GPS information plus the uh, radar uh, maps, we're able to uh, make an estimate of uh, how much the fault moved and and where it moved. Uh, so this is a, what we call a fault slip model. Uh, this is a very preliminary model that was actually made uh, uh, last week by uh, a grad student at Caltech, uh, Benjamin Didini. Uh, just to give you an idea of what we use this, uh, what we can use this ground uh, surface deformation to do by making an, uh, a computer model of the of the uh, elastic structure of the earth plus uh, with uh, some kind of assumption of what the fault planes are, we can then uh, estimate how much e each part of the fault moved uh, at depth uh, just from uh, the measurements made on the surface. So this, is, uh, this will be uh, updated much uh, more with uh, a future analysis, but it uh, gives you an idea of what we use this surface deformation for. Another uh, thing we can do with the radar imagery is uh, look at uh, how much the surface changed in between the two radar uh, images. And we make these products that they're called uh, damage proxy maps. It's uh, a proxy for damage because we, uh, we only know that something changed at the surface. We don't know what exactly changed, but uh, the uh, interferometry uh, measurements actually include a measurement estimate of what we call interferometric coherence. And we could take the interferometric coherence during the, uh, that includes the earthquake and subtract out the uh, interferometric coherence variations that were present before the earthquake. 
and get a, a map that shows where uh, the, the ground surface changed uh, significantly in between the two earthquakes. So uh, the red areas here are the areas that changed uh, strongly. And we can see very clearly the, area, the, the long northwest southeast uh, fault of the magnitude 7.1 earthquake and the uh, shorter southwest northeast fault of the 6.4 earthquake. There's also uh, a large amount of, uh, of change over here in Searles Lake. This is a uh, large uh, area next uh, with the town of Trona that was uh, close to Searles Lake. It's a area of active uh, borax mining uh, for, for, uh, for over 150 years. Uh, and uh, some of this material has slid out into the lake and it's actually caused, it caused a, a huge amount of damage to the city of Tr the small town of Trona that's uh, next to uh, Searles Lake. And uh, we can also see that in some places there's several different fault line here. Uh, so uh, it's clear that this fault, uh, this earthquake ruptured just not only the main fault, but actually a number of other faults uh, during the earthquake uh, process. And we want to, uh, we, we provided this information to the field crew so they were able to go to the field and, and know where to look for the fault ruptures in the field. So in conclusion, uh, we were able to use the uh, surface deformation uh, data to see uh, that the magnitude 6.4 earthquake was on this northeast trending fault and with a left lateral motion where the, uh, the, uh, the far side moves to the left and the main rupture was on a northwest trending fault with right lateral motion where the far side moves to the right we see a, that uh, complex pattern of fault ruptures. And we can use the surface deformation with the radar satellites and the GPS data to constrain our, uh, a model of how much the fault slipped at depth, and then use that to estimate how much the uh, stress has changed on nearby faults uh, that, to see what change in, in probability of earthquakes would be on those other faults. In addition, we use, can use the radar data to uh, map change uh, in, the, in the ground surface, which is often due to uh, the fault breaking or uh, damage to uh, buildings and, and, uh, and roads. And because uh, I work uh, for NASA, I will put in a plug for the uh, NASA uh, ISRO-SAR mission. That's uh, the Indian Space Research Organization cooperating with NASA to build a radar mission that uh, a large part of that's being built here at JPL and uh, will be ready for launch in uh, January of 2022. Uh, so we'll be able to get uh, even more of this type of data available in the future. Thank you. Terrific, thank you so much, Eric and Richard. Those were excellent presentations, very clear and I think you you reached a, a lot of uh, different members of our audience with that. We did get uh, quite a large number of, of questions, and so we'd like to spend some time here uh, sharing those with you just to review. If you haven't had a chance to send questions yet, the instructions are up there, and they'll, they'll remain up there throughout this last sort of a quarter of an hour that we'll be, be talking with Richard and Eric. So just use the Q&A box if you'd like to send us a question, and we'll keep tracking those as they come in. So Richard, I think I'm going to turn the first question over to you. Um, and that is related to um, the plans for delivering uh, public alerts across the Shake Alert region. We actually had a lot of folks from different parts of the entire region asking, well, what about, what about San Francisco? What about San, San Bernardino County and so forth? So wanted to uh, hear a little bit more about um, that, that delivery of the, of the public alerts. Sure. Yeah, I mean, that's really the key question. And we, I mean, we've known that. We didn't need to have this earthquake to know that was the issue. It's the last mile problem. Now that Shake Alert is generating these alerts, how do we push them out and get them out to everybody who wants them? And there are a lot of people working on this. As I mentioned, it's the Shake Alert app um, already for the city of LA. There are various other apps that are under development. 
Um, but actually, before I talk about the apps, there's also an effort to use WEIR. WEIR is the wireless emergency alert system. That's the system that pushes out uh, presidential alerts and AMBER alerts. The challenge with that system is how much time it takes. In fact, that's the challenge with many of these systems, is how do we ensure that the system that we're using pushes out the alert in a second or two, which is what we really need in order to make use of it. So we are system um, testing underway in Oakland and testing in San Diego sort of seems to suggest a few seconds, seven seconds, kind of delays um, in pushing the alerts out through WIA, but there's the hope to use WIA um, later this year. There are several groups who are developing apps as well. Um, in fact, I'm going to share my screen again um, very briefly um, just to show you uh, one of the ones that we're actually working on. Um, so there are several apps um, with several groups. Um, at Berkeley, we've also been working on um, uh, using apps to deliver alerts uh, with the MyShake project. And so this project actually started out, in fact, it still does. It's, it's intended to do two things. It's intended to use cell phones to detect earthquakes. And also, of course, you can use cell phones to then deliver alerts. Um, and so there's a new version of MyShake out actually right now. It's available for Android and for um, um, iPhones. Um, and it's intended to, to give people what they need before, during, and after an earthquake. So there's safety information, there's preparedness information uh, built into the app. Um, there's also, you can look at recent earthquakes, as you can see the example here on the screen, uh, recent earthquakes. People can then use the app to report um, their experiences in an earthquake. Uh, this is a brand new app. We were, it was actually 25% rolled out at the time of the Bridge Crest earthquakes. It's now 100% rolled out. In the center here, you're actually seeing the reported damage across the San Francisco Bay Area in a magnitude 4.3 earthquake that happened just a few days ago. Um, and so people after the earthquake can report um, the, shaking, um, the shaking intensity, very much like did you feel it, many people report to did you feel it, which is great. Um, in addition to that, they can report damage, and that's what you're seeing. All of those um, blue hexagons are showing that there was no reported damage, which is good, given it was only a magnitude 4.3. But then to get to your question, Elizabeth, again, um, we're also testing the delivery of shake alerts using the MyShake app. So the public version of the app does not receive the alerts, to be very clear. So you can download the app for free in the store today, but you will not receive shake alerts today. But we're testing that, and this is a project funded by the California Office of Emergency Services. And they're, they're supporting this to really figure out if we can use this to deliver alerts across the entire region, across California. Um, and so it's in testing right now, but there's a hope um, that later this year um, we'll be in a position to be able to start delivering alerts uh, across California and perhaps beyond that. Um, so to all of the regions that you just mentioned, uh, Elizabeth. That's terrific, Richard. Um, thanks so much. Uh, there was a lot of, uh, as you pointed out too, interest in, um, uh, on the, on the, uh, from the standpoint of the public in, in being able to have uh, lower levels of alerts. And in that sense, is there any plan along the way to uh, allow users to pick their own thresholds for alerts. That may be more, more complicated. Yeah, no, absolutely there is. So it's sort of been interesting. This has swung backwards and forwards. The original versions of the, we had an early version of the app that was used to, to demonstrate shake alert capabilities. And it actually showed you the shaking intensity, estimated shaking intensity at your location, and also a countdown until the time that the shaking started. And we got feedback on this and talking to people in Mexico and getting the early warnings in Mexico and in Japan. And the conclusion was that that was too much information. And instead we needed to have something very simple, which was just saying earthquake, drop cover and hold on, expect shaking. Um, and so that's what we've, we've moved to. That's what the ShakeAlert LA app does. That's what the MyShake app is currently doing in testing as well. I think one of the key takeaways from this earthquake is that that's not sufficient. There's actually a requirement for more information. There's a lot of discussion going on, and of course there's a lot of work to be done to really gather input and lessons learned from this earthquake. But we seem to be going in a direction where maybe there are two levels of alert. So when the earthquake is significant, grade, maybe greater than magnitude five, for example, then you push out an alert and there'll be two levels of alert. There'd be an alert to the region where people are gonna feel shaking, but we're not really expecting damage. So something like intensity three, four kind of range. And then there would be a much more urgent alert, sound, urgent sounding alert, you know, to expect strong shaking. And I think that this would actually address a lot of the concerns 
um, that we're seeing in terms of people's feedback. So, you know, this is an interesting question. This is a social science question. This isn't really a seismology question. Um, but what we need to do is effectively couple that social science with the seismology and our understanding of the physics of the process and the uncertainties in our ability to predict shaking intensity in order to do the best job we can and then make sure that we're delivering the product that uh, the users need. Uh, that's very important, Richard. I, I will heartily agree with that. Thanks a lot. So Eric, there's a question for you. Um, there were some questions associated with uh, the proxy damage maps. And um, one was more, more specific and, and related to the, the source of the significant pro proxy damage on the east side of the slide, I think, that you, you showed. And then related to the proxy damage maps themselves and how they may be able to help emergency managers and responders in, in that case. So I think generally talking a little bit more about the proxy damage maps and, and what they can and can't do. Yes, uh, we think that the, the damage in the, the Searles Lake and Trona area was due to uh, liquefaction and uh, lateral spreading of uh, material. It's not a direct fault rupture. It's a secondary uh, non-tectonic deformation, but clearly uh, doing a significant damage to, uh, I think there's quite a few people that are uh, no longer able to, to live in their houses in, in Trona. Uh, the damage proxy maps, we, we have been uh, producing these for uh, earthquakes and uh, for other uh, types of uh, disasters, including hurricanes and, uh, and floods. Uh, so uh, we, we do get these to uh, emergency responders uh, as soon as the, we can. Uh, the, we have to wait for the satellite to come back over the area and, and collect the second satellite image. And that's one of the reasons why we're uh, working on getting access to more uh, radar satellite systems. And, and uh, there's some commercial companies these days that are working on uh, launching uh, large constellations of satellites to uh, possibly uh, get uh, data very quickly after earthquakes. Great, thank you very much, Eric. That's helpful. Um, so, so actually this question could go to both of you, but, both of you, but I think Richard, it, it came up um, in, in context of your presentation. And that's just simply clarifying for, for folks the difference between the magnitude uh, and, and the Richter scale and the, and the intensity Mercalli scales, if you could. Sure, yeah, this is actually a real challenge I think we face as a community is that there is a huge amount of confusion um, by people using early warning about the difference between magnitude and intensity. So magnitude, for a given earthquake, there is one magnitude. It was a magnitude 7.1 earthquake. And so that magnitude describes the size of the earthquake. Intensity, there are many values of intensity. Intensity is about how strong the shaking is at a given location. And of course, the shaking intensity is strongest, closest to the epicenter of the earthquake. So when you're right at the epicenter, that's where you have the strongest shaking and there will be the highest intensity um, for that earthquake. And as you get further and further away from the earthquake, the intensity decreases. Um, and so when it comes to thinking about the effect of an earthquake on you as an individual, on me as an individual, what matters to me is the intensity of shaking at my location. And that is a function of both the magnitude and the distance that you are from that, that particular location. There's actually a third piece. The third most important factor in intensity is the um, site conditions, what the soils, whether you're on soft soils in a deep basin or on hard rock. So, for example, in the Los Angeles basin, um, the shaking intensity increases compared to the shaking intensity in the adjacent mountains, just because there's an amplification effect. So, so the intensity is what's happening, the shaking at your location, and the magnitude is just a single number that decide, describes the size of the earthquake. Great, and, and Eric, I'm actually going to ask you to follow up on that if you could, because there is some relationship, obviously, between the, the, the behavior of the materials and the deformation you see. So could you, you add on to what Richard shared there, please, with regard to your work? Uh, yes. Uh, when we make the satellite measurements, we are only able to see the overall uh, deformation, uh, which is related to the size of the earthquake source. Um, we, uh, 
then have to use some type of model to estimate what the intensity is going to be at a given location. Uh, but we do also have this second type of uh, measurement, the, the damage proxy map, which actually measures how much the ground surface changed uh, in between uh, before the earthquake and after the earthquake. So in that case, uh, if, if the shaking is intense enough, then it causes uh, a disruption of the ground surface that we can detect with the radar. Thank you very much, Eric. I'm going to follow up on uh, with a slightly different track for, for you. And obviously, you know, Richard, feel, feel free to, to add on to this as well. So uh, for Eric, did the stress from the first Ridgecrest, Ridgecrest earthquake um, increase the probability of, of the second large earthquake? Or also speaking more towards the interaction between those two uh, different earthquakes, was, what was the relationship there? Do we, do we know that? Do we have enough information? Uh, we're, we're actively studying that subject. Uh, we haven't uh, come to a, a final conclusion, but it, no, there's no question that the two earthquakes are closely related. They're, they're very close together and, uh, uh, in both space and time. There's, uh, the details we're still trying to work out. And one of the issues is being able to separate the, uh, the ground deformation that was due to the 6.4 from the, the much larger 7.1 and understand what, what happened in between the two earthquakes. Yeah, if I can add to that, I mean, if you, um, this, it's really interesting to, if you watch an animation of the, you know, the time history of the events, um, these are two, you know, clearly two earthquakes um, that were on two um, perpendicular fault planes, um, but clearly were related to one another. The first event, the smaller event, the magnitude 6.4, has a, it's very difficult to describe this without pointing at a figure, <laughs> but has has a, a, a strike that points to the northeast. But then, if you look at the the pattern of aftershocks, you can kind of see how it actually starts to see a cluster um, of aftershocks that is sort of sim close to the location of what then became the magnitude 7.1 epicenter as well. So the, the point being simply that there is clearly a very interesting and complex. Um, relationship and and between the earthquakes as you go from one to the next, which of course is all determined by this transfer of stress that you're that you're asking about, Elizabeth. And you know, so this is a complex rupture. Um, it wasn't just um, sequential earthquakes on the same fault plane. It was a complex rupture, and this isn't the first time we've seen this. We've now seen several of these um, complex fault ruptures where the um, the seismicity seems to be jumping from one fault plane to another fault plane. Um, I mean, it just shows us, you know, as we see events like this, that these processes are much more complicated than we really, I think, have imagined in the past. And what's different now, again, it comes back to sort of one of the points I wanted to make, that we have this fantastic observational infrastructure today that is the reason that we can see all of this complexity that we were not aware of in the past. Yeah, yeah I'd like I think just I'm to add to that, that Go ahead, there was yeah. a... A similar sequence of earthquakes in 1987 uh, called the Superstition Hills earthquakes, where uh, a, a smaller earthquake happened on, a, on one fault and then a, a larger earthquake happened on a nearly perpendicular fault. So uh, this is something that seems to happen in, in California uh, that's maybe not uh, always happening in other parts of the world, but something we have to be uh, ready for. In fact, uh, one of my colleagues at the USGS who went immediately to uh, Ridgecrest uh, after the, the 6.4 had told the city of Ridgecrest that uh, there was a, a significant chance of a, of a second larger earthquake uh, before the, the 7.1 hit. So they were uh, at least uh, partially warned. I'm, I'm going to follow up. There was, there's a question a lot of a lot of people have been asking, not not just here, but but on the the news. And maybe both of you can can respond to this. And that's with regard to the number of aftershocks. And some folks uh, indicate I saw the number 35,000 uh, maybe aftershocks. And of course, they're of different uh, of different magnitudes. What is the? Uh, some people have said, is, is this unusual to have this number of act, aftershocks? Would would both of you uh, care to, to respond to that? <laughs> Eric, do you want to go first? 
Uh, well, I mean, one of the th reasons that we are actually uh, seeing uh, more aftershocks is that the seismic networks have gotten so much more sensitive than they used to be. So we're able to locate many more aftershocks that at lower magnitudes than, than they were able to locate in the past. So uh, even the same earthquake sequence uh, that today has more aftershocks just because we can see the smaller ones. And there's always many more smaller ones than bigger ones. Yeah, I have to say the reason I was happy for Eric to go first is I don't have a, a, a good answer for you, Elizabeth. It's not clear to me whether we are seeing an unusual number of aftershocks. Of course, you know, the norm, so the norm that we would expect is for one magnitude seven, that we would, um, we would have one magnitude six aftershock, 10 magnitude five, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and it's not clear to me that we've necessarily deviated that much um, from that um, from that history. But I, this is not I'm not an expert on this, and I haven't been watching closely, so I'll I'll stop talking. <laughs> Great, that that that's super. Thanks. I'm seeing that we're we're nearing the end of the hour. Uh, I'm going to ask each of you uh, pr probably a short question, short remaining question, and then we'll do a wrap up. Uh, and so this one uh, to, to you, Eric, and, and this was a, a more specific question, wondering if the, you looked or did JPL look for deformation south of the Garlock Fault? Uh, yes, we've uh, analyzed the satellite images uh, for the whole region. Um, we did see uh, what appears to be some uh, triggered slip on, on a, a small section of the Garlock Fault by perhaps a, a, a centimeter or so. And I, I believe the field geologists have confirmed that, that there was a little amount of a uh, triggered slip on the Garlock Fault itself. Um, but we didn't, haven't seen any significant deformation uh, south of the Garlock, at, at least so far. Okay, thank you. And Richard, then uh, final question to you. Um, and it's uh, actually, we bundled two questions together. So there, the question began, how, how would the system have worked the shake alert system have worked if the epicenter had been closer to LA and in combination with that why is why is getting a warning even of 30 second, seconds or less an important thing? Sure so yes yeah, so first of all the warning time so the warning time is a function of how far you are from the earthquake so that's why I kind of highlighted at the beginning that the city of LA is about 200 kilometers from the epicenters of these earthquakes. And so that's why you've got the 48 um, seconds worth of warning. Um, if the earthquake was closer, then you would have less warning time. Um, there's no question about that. Um, as an example, that magnitude 4.3 earthquake that I mentioned um, in the Bay Area a few days ago, um, that was just east of the Bay Area, um, close to Concord. Um, and so that, the, it's, of course, it's only a magnitude 4.3, but the shake alert, of course, detected it and sent out a warning. And in fact, my colleagues at Berkeley got about four seconds of warning. And so that's an earthquake that was essentially on the margins of the Bay Area, uh, to the east of the Bay Area. Still, Berkeley got about four seconds of warning. The city of San Francisco would get perhaps an additional two seconds of warning over that. So that's a nice example that, um, that yes, even when the earthquakes are close by, of course, you get less warning time. Um, but you still get a few seconds of warning. It's enough, still enough time perhaps to get under a desk. Um, if not, it's enough time to brace yourself. And, and this is one of the things that have come out of social science studies in Japan, that one of the real values of early warning in Japan is just being able to brace yourself um, and being ready um, for that shaking. Um, now, I've forgotten the second half of the question. Sorry, can you remind me? No, that, that's all right. Is, how, is, how would the system have worked if the epicenter had been closer to LA? Yeah, so the system, I mean, it would just have mean there was less warning time. That was the, that was the only difference is that you would have less warning time. Okay, thanks for that. So I'm going to give each of you uh, 10 or 15 seconds to give a final takeaway to the audience. And then I, I want to, to do a, a quick wrap up and, and provide some instructions about uh, the audio recording from today's webinar. So uh, Richard, how about you first? And then Eric, your final takeaway for our audience here. Well, my favorite fact about earthquakes in California remains true, and that is that we still haven't had an earthquake in California that wasn't a surprise. And I mean, I think that's a really kind of shocking thing to realize is that all of the major earthquakes that we've had 
um, have not been on major known faults. That was true of the Napa earthquake, the magnitude 6 earthquake up in the Bay Area a few years ago, and that's true of this earthquake. And I, I think it's good for us, it's humbling, and I think it's important for us to remember that, that we haven't had a surprising event, and so we obviously have to remain vigilant. Eric? Yes, uh, I agree that uh, the faults that have ruptured in earthquakes in the last hundred years in California, except for the Parkfield earthquake uh, of uh, 2014, which was predicted, uh, but was only a magnitude six and, and didn't cause any damage, uh, have all been on faults that, that weren't mapped in, in advance. Uh, so it's a well, that's one of the reasons we go out and uh, collect uh, data of various types, in, both in the field and with satellites, to better understand where deformation is occurring uh, over long time intervals and, and where uh, earthquakes are more likely to happen in the long run. Okay, so we're, we're at the end of our time here. I wanted to thank Richard and Eric for their excellent presentations and and willingness to take your, your questions. And to the members of the audience who had a lot of great questions, we apologize that we weren't able to, to get to all of those. Um, so the, the last slide is up here for those of you in the audience. Um, if you have any questions about our committee on seismology and geodynamics or board on our sciences and resources, you can feel free to reach out to us here on the staff. We have our emails there. I think the most important element that you're interested in is that we'll be uh, sharing the presentations and audio recordings from today's webinar uh, on our website. They'll be posted within seven to 10 days, um, and you should please watch your email for announcements uh, about when that is posted and, and also for future webinars and events. Thanks again so much, Richard and Eric, and, and thanks to our audience. Uh, goodbye, everyone. <laughs>